Welcome back to the physiology of singing, singing, singing. Right? Okay. Um, let's talk about how to conceptualize all this physiology shizzle. Oh my gosh, there's so much of it. Right? Um, and as people often say when they get really confused with pedag pedagogy and anatomy and physiology, you know, people back in the 18th century and the golden age of singing, they figured out how to sing without how to sing without knowing all this stuff. It's like, yeah, that's true. They did. You're right. <laughs> that's because we can learn stuff without really knowing what the heck we're doing. That's totally fine. Um, I think the main reason to think of things in more of a slightly scientifically based way is just to optimize training. I mean, back then people would take voice lessons like every day for however long, you know, or whatever. Training was very different. Societally, structure was different. Who had the money was somewhat different in terms of aristocracy and such and whatnot. Um, so yeah, you know, why not optimize training nowadays? Might as well. So um, power source filter. Uh, it is, what that means is the source filter model, more specifically with power added onto it, is a really great way to conceptualize how your body is coordinating all the subsystems it uses for speech and for singing, since this is a singing blog, blog. Thing. Um, so, what does that mean? Um, means the power is your respiratory system, right? It's the gas that makes the engine go. It's the power source, the air that comes from your respiratory system makes the whole thing work at all, right? Without that, there's no voice, right? So then the source is your vocal fold vibration, your laryngeal system. That source is the source of your sound which without the filter is a little more akin to like uh, a double reed instrument when they blow into their reeds and it's not in their instrument, okay? It's a more akin to kind of a <laughs> kind of sound, <laughs> basically. It's like that, it's a buzz, okay? Um, and then the filter is the vocal tract, including the nasal passages and the lips and all of that, it's pretty much all of the airspace above the vocal folds. Except for the airspace directly above the vocal folds, the superglottic area in the larynx is still kind of considered voice land, but it is part of the filter. But um, in terms of scientific studies and stuff on it, it tends to be looked at more by voice people. So, because it directly affects, it has a very strong impact on vocal fold vibration. So, um, all right. So power source filter. This is a concept that a lot of clinicians use to help ourselves, speaking as a clinician. If I'm walking into a patient's room and I'm trying to assess someone with like, say, a neurological impairment, um, maybe a degenerative condition like a Parkinson disease or something, um, maybe someone who's had a stroke, a uh, traumatic brain injury, all kinds of things, okay? Maybe they were born with it, maybe it's cere cerebral palsy, like a quadriple quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Um, you know, there's something off with their system, right? Um, and so it's a way that we conceptualize what is going wrong at different areas of the system. So, there's a condition called dysarthria, which is a problem with the speech system, the filter essentially, the muscles involved in the filter aren't really working very well. You can have it without voice problems. Um, it can sound sort of like slurred speech. It's a little like actually trivia night time, here we go. Um, when you drink alcohol and your speech starts to slur, it's actually technically a temporary dysarthria due to the alcohol. It's affecting the motor output from your brain. It's affecting those, those neurons, essentially, that's feeding into those muscles. Um, it's not the planning. You can still put the words together in the right way to some extent, you know, within reason. I guess it depends on the drunk person. 
but the slurring, that imprecise kind of articulation is from the muscles not quite getting to the right places, not quite forming the right shapes in the vocal tract to make clear speech sounds. So you end up with kind of a slurry sort of talking, you know? That's, <laughs> that's dysarthria essentially. And it can actually come from, it doesn't have to sound like that. It can sound like a lot of different things um, depending on what the issue is with the motor system. And people who have strokes or other neurological conditions can definitely have a dysarthria. So that's something we have to figure out. Do they have, is, is it, okay, how's their speech? We think about, okay, what's their filter doing? How's the function there? Let me do a few tasks to see how that is. Okay, let me like try to figure out maybe just what their vocal quality is, maybe just ah, uh, like how is it sounding kind of here? Are they struggling with the source? Is it breathy? Is it rough? Is it uh, strained here? Like what am I hearing that's kind of from here? And then what's happening with the respiratory system? Are they able to take big enough breaths for speech? Are they having to breathe too frequently? And it's making speaking really hard because if you have to breathe every like two or three words, it's gonna take you a long time to talk. And there are patients who have issues with that. So this is where a lot of this modeling comes from, especially in therapy land. It's a really nice way to conceptualize what you're hearing and what might be going wrong at different points. And I think it's totally justified that this can be a very nice way to help you if you're a beginning voice teacher or as a vocal student trying to figure out what's going on. So, for example, um, let's say, taking me and my bad habits <laughs> as an example, always willing to be the wrong example here for you guys. Um, you know, let's say that I'm training with someone new and they're using some sort of imagery that just isn't working for me and it's affecting my coordination somewhere. And I need to kind of figure out where the coordination is being affected or maybe the voice teacher wants to figure out where the coordination is being affected. Okay. So if I'm higher level singer, have a lot of knowledge um, and can tell it's not as easy as it should be, then I might want to troubleshoot myself uh, physiologically speaking. So let's say, you know, I'm trying to sing, <clears throat> I don't know, I'm dehydrated and super out of practice, so I'll probably sound horrible on this, but let's give it a shot, shall we? Um, let's do like, okay, that didn't feel great. <laughs> I'm also not warmed up, haven't practiced. I haven't sang opera in a long time, you guys, so here we go. Let's use that. Okay, and let's say this person says, oh, you need a little more power to lift. Let's think about, you know, holding marbles in the back of your mouth or something like that. Okay, so then I come back in and I sing. <laughs> Felt worse. <sighs> what was going on, right? And maybe if I'm a beginner singer, I might not know. Maybe I just need a bigger breath. Okay. Mm. Still not feeling easy here, but okay, I have I feel like I have more breath. Maybe that's good. That's better. That's easier. I don't know. Right? Um Okay. But what's actually happening is I'm using imagery that I know affects my tongue. I'm also purposely kind of pulling it back a little more than I would normally but my tongue root is being pulled back so much that it doesn't feel easy here at all. It feels pretty icky, actually. All right, um, it feels kind of like my, something's like, my sound is like hitting a wall inside my throat, is what it basically feels like. <laughs> um, because I'm pulling it back so much. I'm still able to hear hit the notes, I'm still producing voice, there's still vibration happening. But if I take a bigger breath, it doesn't fix the problem because my tongue is pulling back and I'm still pulling my tongue back trying to adjust the sound of my voice, right? So the actual issue is in the filter. The actual issue is, okay, your filter is not taking a very, a shape that's very conducive to easy vocal production, especially in the context of that phrase in that aria, okay? Right. Now, 
conversely. Let's say that I, okay, maybe it's a different week or whatever, I'll waltz in. I'm like, I totally got it, my tongue's totally released, this is awesome, let's do this, okay? Because what I figured out is I just need to take a bigger breath and I need to send more air through my throat. That's what I figured out, okay? So, let's say that's what I figured out. And so then what ends up happening is I do the first phrase again. I'm dreading this, this is not gonna feel good. And I just try to blow as much air as I can through my voice. So I go, Oh my God, still doesn't feel easy. I'm working really hard. Voice is coming out louder than it should. Don't have a lot of control over it. My, my dynamics are essentially going to be loud, louder, loudest. The loud, louder, loudest phenomenon I talk about tends to happen a fair amount, especially at the university level with young singers in opera. Um, because, yeah, justifiably so, they just think opera equals singing really loud. And, well, it kind of is, but it's resonating, actually. It's resonating really clearly. That's actually what it is, which sounds loud. It's very deceptive. It's not singing loud. <laughs> um, so what happened there? Well, maybe I think it's, you know, if I think it's filter or if I think, you know, maybe it's vocal posturing and I just need to like start with an easier onset maybe. Maybe just... Okay, that didn't really fix it and I ran out of breath really fast because my voice was breathy. I tried to, I did an easy onset and then... I never really got my vocal folds together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So now I'm like just grasping at straws. Now I feel like I need to fix the onset, and but I still need to use a lot of airflow, right? So now I'm thinking I need to fix both of those things at one time. And now I'm starting to get into that, like, I'm going to really try to control my voice really harshly kind of a thing, right? Um, okay, so... Now I'm thinking, all right, drive a lot of air, but get a clean onset. So, <laughs> okay, well, it's feeling a little easier in the throat. I kind of played around with the onset, got it slightly easier. I felt a little more buzz, but I still ran out of air. Oh, man. So something's still wrong, right? And I still think my voice is a little too breathy, too much air escaping from the voice. So maybe my voice instructor would say, yeah, your onset actually wasn't that clean. It sounded a little better, but it still wasn't that clean. There was still a lot of air coming through. Let's fix the onset to help vocal vibration, right? And so you spend a lot of time fixing the onset, da 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 da. Essentially, you go through this process. It's like, huh, every week, right? It's like, okay, now that you got the onset pretty clean on that one phrase, now you move on to the next phrase, and it's, it's poop again, right? But where it all started, the whole issue, and, and where I started getting obsessed with onset was that I was trying to put way too much air through a very small space. My glottal space during vibration is actually pretty tiny. And I was trying to blow a ton of air through there because I thought I needed to be loud, right? And, um, and then that, because my vocal fold vibration, your source is like the seesaw, right? You have subglottal pressure is high, superglottal pressure is low. Then you have a cycle of vibration happen, and then whoop, they trade, right? So the higher I drive that subglottal pressure, the higher the superglottal pressure is going to need to be in order for my body to have vocal flow vibration at all, in order to produce a source at all. It has to, they both have to be like this, right? Which means the higher I drive that subglottal pressure, at the end of that vibration, I'm going to need some very small space above my vocal folds to the point where I'm squeezing probably quite a bit in the superglottic region. That's making it not feel so easy. Um, it's affecting resonance, it's affecting a lot of stuff upstream, right? Filters being affected because I'm squeezing above the vocal folds, probably tongue function is being affected, etc., etc. But I was driving way too much air through my voice. That's essentially how I got into trouble, right? So if I go back down to the respiratory system, and maybe I do some straw phonation, right? I have a video on that. You guys, I can try to link it below. Hopefully I remember to link these things. Hello. 
That would be great. Um, <laughs> if I don't link these things, comment and let me know, because I probably forgot. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so let's say, you know, I try some straw phonation, maybe some easy, or maybe, I'm watching some Joyce DiDonato or maybe some Renee Fleming, you know, master classes on YouTube, and I see that they have people do that. So I do that a little bit. And then I realize, like, oh, I feel like I have to hold back my air a lot more. Yeah. So if I get the inspiratory checking, if I get the breaking, the inspiratory muscles at the bottom of my rib cage, if I get those suckers activated and I keep my exhale really nice and steady, which in me is completely out of shape right now. Maybe I'll still have tongue issue. I might, because I am really out of shape and I might adjust my sound anyway, but I'm gonna think steady, keeping the rib cage out as much as I can, keeping this as easy as I can, like a yawn space, right? And then, perfect. I felt myself adjusting the jaw. I felt myself doing some stuff up here. So I'm gonna have to work on that. But this felt easier. Here down felt a little easier. Not so bad. Right? So. Okay, I'm getting there. You know, it's getting easier and easier. The more I try it, the more I try to not adjust my sound, right? I've got to start using some concepts to help loosen up my filter. Because now the bigger issue is I have a little bit of tension happening in my filter that, yeah, I mean, it makes it a little less easy, but especially the resonance isn't as clear and consistent as I want it to be. So I need to kind of make some adjustments, some subtle adjustments of what I'm doing because now the air is under control a little more. My breath is under control. The power system is doing okay. Laryngeal system, doing pretty good. Filter system just needs a little refining, essentially, right? Like just a touch of refining, okay? Um, it's going to be subtle, but in my head it might feel like it's not subtle, but it's actually going to be a pretty subtle adjustment at that point, from that point on, okay? To really hone and, and get that sound and maybe work on dynamics and work on the emotional, the, the expression stuff, right? So, Hopefully this, this example kind of helps a bit um, because it can definitely affect how you're producing your sound. Um, if somebody tells you some sort of imagery that's really affecting your filter but it's causing your tongue to pull back, that's going to affect your larynx. That's Your respiratory system is probably not going to, your power system is probably not going to feel super easy either. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's like there can be this huge cascade effect of everything, okay? So one of the things, one of the tips I gave um, one of my more recent voice students who was, a, who, who was a, a high school student at the time that I think is a good piece of information. If you're going to use power source filter as like your concept, okay, um, what I would do for her is, you know, like she would sing through something. She was trying to learn both more classical and belt at the same time, so she had a lot to play with. There's a lot of different adjustments you make for different styles, right? And trying to figure out those coordinations can be really tricky, for sure. Um, and there was a day she was working on a classical piece for like a statewide, like, uh, competition-y type thing. And, um, and, you know, she was having to hold these high notes for a long time. She was holding like a floaty high G for a while and she could do it. She had really great high notes. She was kind of like my voice. Like when I was younger, I had really easy, great high notes and like zero low notes. Um, she was pretty much built like me. So, <laughs> so she had these great high notes. It was a great piece, you know, it worked really well for her, but then, um, holding the high note was not as easy. Right. Um, so whenever she tried to adjust something to make it sound better, you know, Sometimes, like, I, I would kind of put it in her hands because she was getting closer and closer to the actual performance. And as a teacher, I tend to, especially for more advanced students who I know 
have these concepts and they know they can make adjustments on their own, I encourage them to figure out. I encourage them to play with it a little bit under my guidance in the lesson. That's just how I sort of started teaching for a while there. So because it's getting closer, because she needs to be in charge of her voice on that day, I'm like, okay, you know, how did that high note feel? Oh, I kind of ran out of air. All right, well, let's try it again. Figure out what you think might be going on. And she was thinking of palette and pharyngeal space, and she was thinking filter. So she tries it again. Didn't make it a whole lot better. So then I was like, okay, well, what do you think you can do? She was still stuck on it probably being filtered because she was feeling the tension here. She was thinking, mm, something's going on here. As a voice teacher, though, I could tell it was more laryngeal positioning and, and respiratory that was more of the issue, right? And so just physically, she wasn't taking up enough breath. She wasn't really controlling the exhale all the way through the note. She was kind of holding her, her breath, which was really affecting laryngeal function. So the big tip I gave her is after the second try of adjusting filter and it didn't really work for her, I was like, think a subsystem down. What's, your, what's happening in your larynx? Let's try it again. And then she was like, oh, I feel like I can't let my voice out. I feel like I'm kind of holding it back. Ah, let's check one more subsystem down. What is your respiratory system doing? What's the power system doing? And she tried it again and she was like, I'm holding my breath. I'm like, mm -hmm ding 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 light bulb goes on right so and then it's like okay let's do it again think of a way for you to not hold your breath to really let that air go and once you're out of air you're out of air like don't worry about holding the note for however long you really should be holding it just hold it until it stops being easy and cut off now cut off before it stops being easy <laughs> that's the next step to make it really polished right but um you know we kind of built it up that way um, and there were definitely days where it was the reverse. She would be playing with her breath and I'd be like, check your laryngeal system. What's it feel like? Check your filter system. Something funky going on up there? You know? So it can be a great way to just check in with different parts of your body to see what it feels like. If you feel like something's hard or I'm losing my air on that phrase, but the bigger breath I take isn't making it any better. I take a really big inhale and I still run out of air. What's going on? Well, check your larynx. Does it feel easy here? Does it feel like it's being held? Does it feel like it's being squeezed? How's your filter? What does your tongue feel like? Is it pulling back a little bit? Um, do you feel like you need to control stuff here? Like your jaw needs to, your mouth needs to be in a very specific place or else you're not gonna get there. Um, watch yourself do it maybe. Video yourself and watch and see like, do I start getting tight in a certain point in that phrase? Because maybe that's where you start to try to control it and hold it a bit. And maybe that's the concept that you need to kind of let go of so you can get through that phrase, right? Um, and same thing for voice teachers. It's a great way to conceptualize, like I was saying with that student, I could see physically what was the problem at that particular time for the sustaining those high notes. I could see what she was doing. <laughs> I could see that her respiratory system was not like she wasn't taking a big enough breath and she wasn't really controlling her rib cage. The inspiratory muscles weren't really checking it. So her exhale was going, it was like just disappearing on her, right? Um, you know, and then it wasn't quite as free as it should be. She looked tense here. I could see like, you know, the torso was kind of rigid instead of movable and flexible. And as I've had a really amazing voice teacher once tell me, movement is the opposite of tension. So yeah, if you're holding and tense, move it, move the, <laughs> move the part that's tense. In fact, when I train uh, respiratory, when I train inhalation, because taking a really big inhalation for classical, we tend to need bigger inhalations because we have longer phrases in opera and usually in higher tessitura, so we're singing higher notes for a longer time. You need more air <laughs> to do it, you just need more air. But you need so much alveolar pressure. When you take a really big breath, you have high air pressure in your lungs, and you don't want all that air pressure to ram through your throat at the same time. You just, you can't. It's the, the throat is a tiny tube, okay? It's going from big area to little area. So you gotta control it, okay? And you gotta resist the, the amount that your ribcage wants to collapse and your lungs want to deflate and the air wants to leave, <laughs> okay? Because it wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. It wants to go out. Um, 
and it's very high pressure in your lungs initially. So I like to train it. And it's like, ultimately, when you first learn, even if it's low breath, you first teach someone to take a really deep, easy breath. <gasps> They're going to keep going, and then you start to see shoulders do this, and I go, okay, now wiggle your shoulders. Just wiggle them. Take a breath. Hold your breath. Wiggle your shoulders. Wiggle your shoulders. Okay. Just, you know, bobble head. Move the shoulders. Make sure this stuff, these muscles, are not helping the respiratory system. They're just their own thing. You know? We're just teaching the brain they're separate, right? So wiggle. Check in. Make sure the only thing that's tight, the only thing that's working are the muscles around your rib cage, for the most part, really. Um, maybe your abs are a little released. You've got some nice feeling there. But those muscles at the bottom of the rib cage, maybe in the back even, are just really working, you know? Um, and the shoulders are not. The shoulders are not helping. Clavicular area, this area is not helping, right? something to train for the power system just to make sure you have good control over your power system right if you're learning how to drive and you slam on the gas every time you're probably gonna have a pretty bad accident at some point right like that's not how we drive we don't slam on the gas I mean maybe some people drive that way um, <laughs> especially in the city where I live there's some people who do that but you know it's not the ideal way to drive. You want to ease the gas, right? You want to ease on the brakes. You don't want to just be like, bam, done, stop, <laughs> right? Um, so power system just needs nice, steady control. Source system needs to be fairly stable perceptually as far as you're concerned because it's just oscillatory. It's just doing this. That's all it needs to be doing. Buzzing away. <laughs> it just needs to be doing that whole time, right? So it needs to be pretty steady. That's your source, right? Just like the gas going into the engine needs to be steady. If you got an issue with the gas going into your engine and it's sputtering, you don't have a smooth go, right? You have like a, uh, 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 uh. if you guys ever listen to car talk on NPR before the guys retired and then unfortunately before passed away, but um, <laughs> those guys are so great. But you know, people will call in and they'd be like, well, yeah, your fuel injection system is kind of, you know, right? It's like, if you get kind of sputters of gas into your engine, you don't have a very smooth go, you know? So same thing with your voice. You want it to just vibrate nice and easy. Um, and the filter system is really malleable and really flexible and can change a lot. Just You just don't want it to impact the downstream source and respiratory system as much. So whatever changes you make to the filter need to be subtle enough. Like in your head, they need to be just subtle enough that you're not impacting this function or this function, ideally. And you might a little bit, but you know, you don't want to impact them hugely, essentially. So that's one way to conceptualize it. If something's going wrong, check in with the other subsystems. How is it feeling? Go a little downstream of where you think, if you think the problem is your tongue, go a little downstream and see what you're feeling like elsewhere. Just check in, just see what's going on, you know? Um, because maybe it's affecting those other things, and maybe if you think of one, you can kind of loosen up the others, especially as a singer. Um, and that's just a way to start refining your own technique, and as a teacher, kind of refining how you pinpoint what's going on with your singers. Um, maybe if they're struggling with something and you just can't quite figure out what it is that's really causing the issue, yeah, just think. Let me check in with the subsystems. How does this feel? How does that feel? What you feel like your ribcage is doing? How is it doing? You know? And maybe just calling attention to a certain area of the body will actually already improve it a bit. Because um, I'm telling you, that whole perceptual prefrontal cortex awareness thing is like kind of magic like that. Sometimes it just works for some people. And some people, you bring awareness to it and then they get super obsessed with fixing it. And it's like, no, no, I'm going to give you something else to think about. <laughs> no, you think of something completely opposite because that's not working out for you. All right, so um, hopefully that's helpful. Power, sort power, ribs. I'm touching lower ribs. You can't really see right now, but power, respiratory, source, voice, filter, vocal track. Filters, vocal quality, the kind of sounds you're putting out, the chiaroscuro, all that stuff, whether it's hypernasal or hyponasal, all that stuff is filter. Source being, is it a pretty steady, like, yeah, you just got some vibration happening? Sweet. Okay, 
Does it feel easy here? It should feel like nothing's happening here, okay? For a nice, easy vibration, other than putting your finger there and feeling vibration. Ah, uh, I can feel it buzzing my hand. That's the buzz is the source right here, okay? And then power being air and your control over the exhale. Nice, easy, relaxed inhale so you don't have things affecting the source. Controlled exhale so the air doesn't impact the source itself either. It just is just the right amount for this to buzz nice and easy the whole time that you're singing, right? The singing happens on an exhale. So instead of breath support, I like to think of breath control because it's really more like controlling the gas in your engine with the gas pedal. It's learning how to navigate your rib cage and all these other muscles that are involved with the power source, the power system, such that the airflow is beneficial to the voice, is helping with vibration and making it nice and easy and steady. All right. So there we go. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, this might impact some folks. Um, the person who requested this actually is a trans woman. And so she was saying that, you know, it's really important for her, especially singing because her vocal tract is probably a lot, big. it's probably longer actually than, um, than a cis females. And so just total side note, that is something definitely, um, especially for voice feminization, which is therapy that I do do. I do do, <laughs> do do, I do, <laughs> I do voice feminization therapy, um, it's something I really enjoy doing, um, but that is one of the biggest things, is that um, really it's, you know, yeah, there's some changing of, of vocal pitch, but I think the biggest piece of it is the change in vocal quality, which is a filter thing, um, because you have to work against this longer than at, than the average female vocal tract, which we cannot change with any sort of surgery because no, the vocal tract is like, it's your neck. <laughs> it's your neck and your mouth. And there's like lots of important things going on there in terms of swallowing and breathing that like, no, we're not going to mess with that surgically, right? So, um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, if you have a longer than average vocal tract, um, your resonance is going to sound a little darker because larger spaces resonate lower frequencies and that can give a more masculine sound even if the pitch is raised. So I would imagine especially, I have not had a, a transgender client who has been a singer yet, but I can only imagine trying to adjust technique to be more in the female range plus having um, a singing voice, having to deal with all that different range and different resonances in that area, that's quite a feat. So <laughs> amazing, like super flexible. Oh my gosh. Um, so to that poster, you are a vocal superstar as far as I'm concerned, because that's awesome. That's like super, super dope to be able to adjust and maybe take like the therapy, I'm assuming probably therapy, uh, sort of techniques and, and, and connecting them to singing. Um, not easy to do. So, and true for anyone out there who's ever had vocal therapy for injuries, it's also not easy to do then either. I know. So superstars, hats off to the vocal superstars out there. All right. Um, yeah. So hopefully this was helpful and hopefully I remember to link things. And if I don't, please let me know. But Mainly videos on respiratory system, laryngeal system, and filter. I actually have a vocal track one um, that's more like a filter and harmonics and resonance and how that works. I have videos on those, so feel free to look through my videos on my channel um, if any of that is a little confusing as to how it works altogether. This was more of just a summary for everybody. All right. Um, please keep posting below if you want to know anything more about physiology and, and uh, singing or if you're confused by any sort of terminology that's used or need some tips for singing or tips for teaching. I am more than happy to do some things like that. Uh, I do have in the works another plan, which I think I will probably get to tomorrow because it's starting to get very bright behind me thanks to the sun. Um, and... Um, I don't want to totally wash out everything here, make it darker. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, that is mic technique for, for teachers of singing who were trained classically. 
because we tend to not get a very good appreciation that mic technique is a real thing and it really needs to be respected and it really needs to be learned if you're going to be teaching any students who need it.